Thinking and you're listening to Thinking Off Piste, a podcast sharing inspiring stories from adventurers around the world. Thinking Off Piste is brought to you by Maybe Ski, a Whistler-based adventure ski company creating bucket list ski trips across the globe. If you're looking to get off the beaten track and away from the crowds, head over to maybeski.com to discover what lies beyond your lift pass. Today I'm talking with the youngest woman to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean, Jasmine Harrison. The 21-year-old swimming teacher from North Yorkshire set off on her 3,000-mile journey from the Canary Islands in December. She docked in the Caribbean last week after completing the journey in 70 days, 3 hours and 48 minutes. What was it like being all alone in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Was that tranquil or terrifying? It depended on the day. It was both. Um, it was the most amazing thing ever. Um, all the time tranquil until the weather changed and you psyched yourself out and suddenly it's terrifying. Um, so it's keeping that cool head the entire time. Yeah, I bet. And do you still love rowing or was that enough for one lifetime? Um, I think it's great. I'd still row. I didn't actually... You get fed up of rowing after a day of doing it. And then when you have a break, it's like, oh, I want to be rowing again. Um, but I've also, I've got nowhere to go at the moment. I quite like actually having to get somewhere. So I'm like... Have like a target, a goal in sight. Yeah, exactly. So what inspired you to row across the Atlantic Ocean? I was here in Antigua three years ago and I just heard about the race. And they said, oh, there's people that are rowing across the Atlantic. And I was like, I want to do that. That sounds cool. And um, then I watched a finish and the media was like, I'm going to do that and have. Amazing. What was it about the race that really appealed to you? I don't know. Um, I think it was just something cool. And actually at that point, I just wanted a bit of an escape. And that was like, yeah, I wanted a target and to target, to get hit in here differently and how literally everybody else doesn't do it. Yeah. Um, I like that. I, I like being a bit odd and a bit different to other things. How come you decided to do it solo rather than as like a team? Um, it wasn't even really a decision. It just, it was just there. It's solo. That's it. Um, don't know why. It just, that was the only option to me. And yeah. I know now thinking about it, like I was thinking back, why didn't I decide to do it as a team? I would actually have not been able to, I wouldn't have done it if I was looking for a team because I don't still don't know anybody that I think I would really want to or they'd be able to put with me and all of that. And yeah. because I was doing it for the adventure by yourself, if I was in a team, if I was going for any sort of speed record or something like that. Um, but I, li- I like doing things by myself. Well, massive congratulations. Um, and in doing, the, in doing this adventure, you raised money for charity. What did, how much did you raise? Uh, I've not actually checked it today, but it's nearly £20,000 so far. I wow, think. that's incredible. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, who are your charities and why did you pick them? So my first charity is Shelterbox. And so I picked them because when I was over here in the Caribbean last time, that's when Hurricane Maria struck in 2017. And they did lots of relief work. And basically, if I can help that, because I've kind of seen the damage like firsthand, it's like, yeah, I want to do that for them. And that's how I got involved is by being over here. And without that happening, I wouldn't have ever done this race. My second charity is Blue Marine Foundation. Um, and so they uh, help restore the oceans to health and protect from overfishing. And that's just extremely appropriate for what I've just done and the beauty that I've seen in the sea. Yeah. And what kind of training did you do to have to like prepare yourself to row that kind of a distance? So it wasn't just about the training itself, the entire preparation to start with. You've got to, first of all, get a boat, um, do all the maintenance and actually get your boat to race standards. Um, and then it's, you've got to get sponsorship. You've got to be able to buy it. And then it's training on top of all of that. Um, and so I was going to the gym like, six times a week. And then finally, when I got my boat, um, put them on the water and actually train out on the water. So I did the mandatory 120 hours that the Talisker Skit Lads Challenge makes you have to do before you are allowed to compete. Um, and that was it really. And then the mental prep as well, the training itself, it's, it was like a year and a half worth of just like a full-time job, not just the physical training because wow. 
out there in the ocean, you can't actually train for it. That's why it's the world's toughest row. You can't prepare for it massively like that. You know, people would say to me, um, so what's the longest you've rode for? I'd be like, nine hours? But like, what? And you think you're going to be able to do it for like a hundred days? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> because I'm not going to train for a solid week going out and rowing. You know what I mean? You're not going to train and row across to wherever because that defeats the object of what you're trying to then actually achieve. You know? Yeah. It, there's a difference. You're not going to go to do a marathon and train by doing marathons. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a different scale, but um, even just training out for like more than 24 hours, it's like, that's when it's tough. That's when you might as well be out doing the actual crossing. Um, so yeah, it was just lots of smaller hours at a time. What was the mental preparation? So I actually got sponsored by like a hypnotherapist, basically wow. just talk through, make sure that you get put in a, um, it was just like more of a, like an emergency type thing. If I'm really unhappy, how to put myself back into a happy place. Yeah, um, that's so cool. But I never ended up being that unhappy and that feeling like I needed it. And the rest of the time for me, the mental prep was actually just n- going over things in my head and making sure that I am fully aware of what to do and how to do it. So I was constantly thinking, right, if this scenario comes up, what do I do? And I then, right, let me read this book, Google something, the smallest thing like this nearly happened. If a boat comes towards you, what kind of flare do you do? You've, I've done courses for it, but it's like, right, double check, make yeah. sure I'm fully aware of everything. Um, and for me, that was my mental prep is just making sure that I had gone over things and double checked. Yeah. If anything, it's a confidence boost. And sometimes yeah, like exactly. not looking at it as the whole overarching journey, but just breaking it down to its little components, then being like, when that happens, I do that. When that happens, I do that. And then it makes the whole, the whole scope of it not so scary because it's like, I know how to do each little chapter. So you can tackle the whole thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. How, how did you go about finding a suitable boat that was sort of light enough to row yet comfortable enough to sleep in and to live in for that length of time? So there is just standard ocean rowing boats. They have to, the one that I needed, it had to meet the criteria of Atlantic campaigns to be able to do this race. So the safety officers would check and make sure that it was suitable. So I went to the start line for last year's race and was walking along, looking at all the different boats. And there was just one that really stood out to me. I was going basically boat shopping. Can I have a look at your boat? Can I stand on it? Can I, can I sit here? Can I, can I go in the cabin? Will you let me go in your cabin? Little things like that. And so I was going along looking at everybody else's boats and there was just one that just stood out to me. I was like, that's my boat. Yeah, I want that my boat. baby. And again, it was different to all the other boats that were there a little bit more. It was... Um, it's called an R15 and it was just cool. That was just, I just knew that was going to be my boat. Like when you go and like, like cattle puppy shopping and then you like, there's one that just jumps out at you and you're like, I'm taking you home with me. <laughs> it's like finding your thing. Yeah, exactly. That's As- literally what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so let's talk about the journey. What was your favorite part of life at sea? Um, probably just the fact that I was out at sea. Um, that I wasn't on land, stuck doing normal life. Um, I loved the nature, the, yeah, just watching the sunsets, the yeah. views. Well, I say the views, you were literally staring at water the entire time. There's nothing <laughs> else to see. But um, it's that, that, yeah. How many times in somebody's life are you going to be in a place where you can't see land for such an extended period of time? And so that was like my favorite point, actually realizing how lucky I was and Mm. to have been here and to be doing it. That was quite, I really enjoyed that thinking. I enjoyed thinking. And what was it like not having any physical human company for two, three months? Nice. To be honest, (laughs) it was a bit strange though. Um, Like I was expecting it to not have anybody. Like you you prepare for that. And yeah, I had contact, but it was really nice to just be by yourself. And at the same time, I was thinking, I'm doing this because this is an adventure. I think if there was somebody else in my boat right now, I'd be like, get off, get off my boat. Um, And so it was just like, yeah, 
I quite liked not having anybody. It sounds awful. I love humans and I can talk forever. Um, but this was, that was my thing. You know what I mean? And so I needed to complete it by myself. I can imagine that because you know it's not, it's only going to be for a certain duration of time and you are going to be coming home effectively. It makes it so much nicer to have the break because it's not like you're indefinitely not going to yeah. see someone. So it's like nice to have the, the yeah. break. Yeah. And also knowing that everybody will want to know me and talk to me when you get back. It's yeah. like, I'm going to enjoy this right now with, <laughs> with nobody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. how easy was it to navigate the route all by yourself, like alone? Um, I thought it was going to be really difficult. That was one of the things I was really worrying about was the route that I take, this and that. But it was all just so dictated by the weather. There was nothing I could actually do. Um, like you just go where the wind takes you, basically, because there's, you can't fight against it. I tried when the wind was pushing me in the wrong direction. Um, the trouble then started to come when you get a bit closer to land and you need to really hit a target. And so the navigating there is a little bit harder just because if you overshooted it, the wind directions made it then impossible to come in. And that was quite, or it, it seemed like it was a bigger deal than maybe it was. I, I'm not really sure. But the navigating, you just row it almost. You go down and then you row across. Yeah, it's not massively complicated. And as you're alone for the journey, it must have been hard to sort of let your guard down from a safety point of view. How did you manage to sleep and row through the night safely? Um, I mean, the biggest thing that would affect the safety is something being in the water, as in another boat, because there's nothing else to hit. Um, and I had systems on board that would tell me if there's another boat coming. Sometimes they worked, sometimes it didn't. But the chances of you actually hitting another boat when you're so small in such a big ocean is like one in a thousand, one in a million. I don't know. Um, so it was... It's just trusting and knowing that the chances it's going to happen are quite low, relatively. Yeah. So you just you just do it and you're tied onto your boat. You've got your, I say you're tied on as well, but you've got something called a PLB, your personal location beacon. So even if you did go overboard and off away from your boat, you can't go back. Hopefully you can activate this device. It doesn't last very long, but the support people can pinpoint where you are and maybe you'd be able to be found again. Yeah. So... Yeah, you can just, there's no difference in, from, I don't, I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but it's <laughs> relatively safe compared to what people think. Did you encounter any obstacles like along your course? Um, yeah, I had a big boat that came up to me um, in the middle of the night. That was quite scary because um, it was going to hit me, but I just needed to, that's the thing is that, that mental prepping of training and the courses that we have to do before you even go on it is what to do in that situation. Yeah, um, cool. I radioed them up and I managed to go away from them, but it was quite close. That's scary. So you mentioned that like everything you do is kind of it's based upon like how the weather is and how the waves, like how the ocean is reacting that day. How temperamental did it get? Like, did you really struggle to row through it? How big did the waves get? It was really temperamental. Like one day as massive 20 foot waves and really strong winds going in one direction. And then suddenly it would calm down and I had a completely flat, calm glass, like water the entire time for like a week. Wow. Um, it was really, really, it's incredible actually seeing the different changes. I just put it in words that every day I was on a different ocean. There was not a single day that it was the exact same as the day before. Wow. Like, and even throughout that day, the conditions never that consistent and even though the report and the weather says from a forecast it's, it should be the same as yesterday no it should be the same the exact same uh swell the exact same wind direction same sun same clouds and I'm like I'll tell you for a fact <laughs> it's not like it's really not so it was quite interesting to have that um changeability within literally a few hours like you can see rain coming and it's you know people say that like their book list is to stand like underneath a cloud like the rain there and not the rain and I'm like that, you can literally see patches of the rain all around you because there's nothing else to see there's nothing in your way there's no buildings no trees there's no mountains either to stop you from seeing it yeah. and so that was quite cool to be able to see and just how quickly things change 
kind of shows you what the world's capable of. Like we can do as much, like we can build infrastructure and try to build houses and stuff. But at the end of the day, the, there's, we just can't compete with the elements. Yeah, exactly. Two days before you crossed the finish line, you capsized. Um, can you walk me through what happened there? Um, I was asleep in my cabin and then it was a rough night anyway. I called it that you would get like punched by the waves when I was asleep, that basically a big wave would just hit the side of the cabin and it would jump you across. And like things that were on this side were then on this side. And that kept on happening. So I was struggling to sleep anyway. And I just managed to get to sleep. I hadn't been asleep for very long. And it was about four o'clock when a massive wave came and the noise of it is honestly like thunder. And you could just feel yourself going. I was like, I was on the side. I basically had knocked down. I was like, it's going all the way over. It's going all the way. Definitely. There's nothing I can do. But I think it's just like woken up and you know, you hit the ceiling. My light comes on. There's a nice little gift for you in the middle of that. I'll give you some light. Gosh, that's the last um, thing you want in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I was just like, you're then on the ceiling, then you're straight back down on this side. And honestly, it was then afterwards, it all happened so quick that you don't know what's gone on. And it's then after I was like, my head hurts. I remember hitting my head. Like I remember the noise. The biggest thing is actually, I just remember the noise um, of hearing other things fall around me, the thump, the noise of my head crashing against oh. a wall to then little things. And it's just like, yeah, the noise is what I remembered rather than the physical thing. I can't remember, like my eyes were open. I don't really remember seeing anything or thinking like, where do I put my hands? Do I protect my head? Do I do my arms? Like what happens? And, um, and then you get left like back on your cabin floor. And I was like, like okay, ow. I was just like, ow, that hurts. <laughs> I don't know where it hurts, but it does. So I was like, <laughs> my head hurts. My back hurts. I've landed back on something. Don't know what it was, but I landed on something. It really right. hurts. I'd like, even now I've still got like big bruise, like a cut down my back. I oh landed on something. And then I was like, my elbow. I was like, my elbow really hurts. I can't bend it. I was like, I literally can't bend my elbow. It's terrifying. What, how did that happen? What did I hit? Yeah. And it's just like afterwards looking at like battery monitor screen, it's got a big crack on it. And this is like safety glass. And I'm like, is that my elbow that did that? That's not Might good. I don't know. And I'm looking at it and it's like, you're so confused and dazed. And even like stopping, I don't know which way up in the cabin I was. It just, you forget about it completely. Um, and it's sort of like, all right, I'm alive. That's the main thing. What we'll move on. What happens now? And then go on deck and check that. And then it's checked that your boat's okay. Uh, check you're okay. Check your boat's okay. Because next thing is, if a hatch had opened or something, do you open it and it's filled with water? You might sink. Yeah. And so it's all a practical stuff after that. Make sure I've not lost any oars. Because you know, my oars are attached to the outside of my boat. And if they've gone over, then I can't physically get to my destination because I can't row there, you know? Um, but yeah, it's quite mad. Gosh, that sounds like a really scary like experience. What was going through your head? Is it like panic or were you just like calm, collected, A, B, C? Um, mixture, very mixed. Um, it was more you at that point, you think of like the very worst that can happen and you're like, no, I'm, I am aware what's going on is the first thing. Um, and then it's like check things but still panic a little bit because I'm then thinking right later on, I'm like, I can't move my arm. I'm like, I can't row if I can't move my arm. Is this why you've got the, um, you've got a cast on right now? No, um, that was, uh, at the finish line. I just burnt myself. Oh, badly. <laughs> oh my gosh. How did you burn yourself? Uh, just on flare. Oh, fair enough. Fair um, enough. So when you light the flare, it literally, the wind, Took it. This was like a dodgy one. I watched the footage back and it literally just went straight down and was on my hand and I'd turn it trying to get it away. But yeah, too late. At least it happened trying to celebrate something and not for the wrong kind of reasons. Yeah, exactly. That's what I sort of think. I'm like, it could have happened in the middle when I was going to use a flare to warn a boat that I was coming. That, sorry, not that I was coming, that they were going to hit me. Um, Did you have any um, damage to your boat out of interest from that whole ordeal? No, not really. Um, I mean, I'd capsized before and I lost a bit of like a couple of things. So I like lost um, a speaker. I lost a sock, you know, but nothing. I'd be sad about the speaker. part of, oh yeah, I was massively. <laughs> but um, it's, you, there's nothing on the boat. Anything that's really um, important is 
put away or is attached. So my, pretty much everything's always attached anyway. Um, and so my boat is fine. There's nothing wrong with him. I, I, did, I tried my best to look after him as much as possible. And he's, yeah, he's fine. good. Good. And I hear you reacted badly to some seasickness medications. Can you describe what effect this had on you and how that came about? So, it's a very, I spoke to one of the other solo rowers about it, which is when I'd finished. It's a very long story. Um, okay. <laughs> but basically, yeah, I had these patches on and they just messed with me. Not, didn't realize it, it was happening because you know when something is and you're just normal and there's no reasoning to you to why you, that something's going on. And so you are so believing. So I could see things like hallucinating stuff with, that was like on my boat and I'm like wow it's not there. <laughs> but because yeah because you think you're normal um you believe it yeah like you're like and it just seemed normal because I was I was physically seeing something and it's like well, it's really strange I was just seeing other people I had other people coming and talking to me <laughs> and um so you did have company in your head yeah <laughs> for the first two days. Uh, the biggest thing, actually, I didn't really care about that. That's, that's not in any sort of like danger to me. Um, it was the fact that I couldn't actually, I couldn't see, I lost my short sight. Um, and so I couldn't wow. see my navigation. That's detrimental on your own. Yeah. I didn't know where I was going was the biggest thing. And I was listening to the other people that then were on my boat. So these random people would appear on my boat in my head, just sat in front of me. <laughs> And they'd tell me which way to row. They'd be like, just row that way. Just row that way a little bit further. And I'd just listen to them. Oh my God, that's terrifying. <laughs> How off course did you go? I've not yet looked at my tracker <laughs> or the race, but I believe it's a very wonky line in circles. That's um, crazy. It's so dangerous. So, yeah, there was, yeah, especially the biggest thing was actually, I just, I, it was, I hallucinated also like my fears. So my fear is land. When you're out on your boat, it's land. Not being able to see land because I've had a bad experience with that before when I was sailing. Um, not being aware that there was an uninhabited island right in front of me and nearly ran aground. And that, that's not good. Oh, in the middle wow. of the night. And so it's, from that, that's been like a fear being stuck in my head. And so whilst I was then rowing, I thought I could see, I was at the bottom of like a cliff face and there was... I was going to crash into this cliff because it was just a wall of black. Um, I mean, it might have been a cloud or something. And so that was like the biggest scare for me whilst I was doing it was actually that I thought I was there and I couldn't physically row. And there was nothing that I could do to train my brain and say, it's not there. It's physically, it can't possibly be there. But because I didn't have my navigation, because I couldn't see, I had no reassurance. So I knew in myself, it's not going to be there, but I can't double check. Yeah, I mean, so it's like that battle of rational versus irrational. It's like, what can you do? So I actually just sat there and I just rode it literally in a circle all night long because um, I couldn't go to sleep. I was terrified. If you go to sleep, you don't know what happens. Um, and that was the biggest sort of fear and what went on. Sort of some other things, but um, that's just weirdness. Talk about things you can't like prepare, like mentally prepare yourself for on a big journey like that. That's probably up there as one of the main ones. Yeah, exactly. How long did it take for your sight to come back? Um, it was another 24 hours after I took off the patches for it fully. I mean, it got a little bit better like, like afterwards, but um, it was like 24 hours before everything then became back to normal. And I was like, right, I can row now. So that was like three days or something, just wasted. Well, not wasted because I was still out there having cool experiences, you know. How often do you hallucinate in your life like that for no reason? Um, the one thing I'd be terrified of is like hallucinating that I was just next to land and then just trying to get out the boat and then just drowning or something. I don't know. Mm. That would be super scary. I think that is actually quite worrying now. And I think back and I'm like, I could have thought anything. I could have not. I, I don't know. I might not have been attached to my boat that entire time. I don't know. can't remember. Didn't know what I was doing. Um, but then that's also why you have the safety office and everything is drilled into you right from the start. It's you are this, you've got to make sure that, you've got to that. And you also have that fear of, well, I do. You get everything right at the start. If you start off right, it can, you know, 
you'll be okay. It's if you start off wrong, or maybe things will get worse. So. Makes sense. And had you taken that um, sort of patch before, like the medication, or was it, or were you even aware of the side effects from it? Not aware of the side effects. Didn't, or if I'd been told about them, forgotten. Um, I'd, I'd never been seasick before, but this was like, everybody said, if you've never been seasick before doing your training rows, the likelihood of you being seasick on the crossing is a lot higher. And I'd never been seasick, not felt it on a training row. So I thought, oh no, I'm going to have the worst seasickness ever. Because even last year, there was um, a pair and one guy, it was so seasick, he literally got taken off the boat after two weeks um, and airlifted away to another island, wow. like Cape Verde. And so it's like, that was my fear. So right, let's do everything to prevent that. Let's wear these patches just in case. Can't be any harm, just in case. <laughs> Famous um, last words. It, it turns out we can. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you have so, any moments where you wanted to give up on the journey? Um, no, because I can't, you can't give up. You literally can't. The quickest way for you to get to land is to row to Antigua. And so if you start thinking, I need, to, I want to give up, that's you've done. And it ruins the entire experience. Yeah, I'd be daft to say there wasn't negative thoughts in my head but even now if I admit that that's not good was there did you actually see any other people at all because you, you mentioned it was a race so did you see other contestants along the way or were you literally alone for that whole time nope I was alone for that entire time you don't see any other boats the I saw, so there's two support yachts and they come past and literally take a photo of you and then off they go um and that's literally it they're there in a very emergency, um, but they are still up to five days away from you and maybe even more. Wow. Um, so I saw them guys. They were the people that I saw one after a week and then one at like 50 days. So I, I did have over 40 days with nobody. Um, so it was, it was strange seeing them for the second time as in the second support yacht. It was like a person. And it's like, how do I speak? <laughs> waving at somebody I've not waved for like ever it was a bit strange like that but it was quite nice as well we do this I forgot about this custom (laughs) yeah exactly so you had no human contact aside from perhaps by satellite phone and you weren't influenced by sort of any man-made systems or structures what sense of perspective did you get from being out in the ocean for so long did you have any sort of relevations or epiphanies or you know when you just have enough time to yourself to think did you have any like key moments like that? So I spent a lot of my time not thinking of stuff like that. It was more, I was trying to decipher my own life. I was trying to answer questions like, why did that happen? What did I say in this conversation that long ago? And I was sort of having to, I was going through everything and organizing it and putting it into things like, that was a stupid thing to say 10 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, forget about it, put it to bed, leave it there. It was quite a lot of stuff like that and thinking, why, why do I think this way? What influenced that particular thought? Who influenced that? Uh, it was just a lot of questions, why? And more, not why is in, why is the world round? You know, I, I, don't, I don't care about that. Um, it's like, more philosophical. why? Yeah more like why am I thinking why do I believe that why do I act like that why did I say that um that's interesting yeah and so that when you've got a lifetime to answer it's quite it's quite a lot of thoughts did you get bored like how did you entertain yourself um so the the most boring times was when I was on power anchor Uh, but that meant that I had been rowing for a long time before that like non-stop trying avoid this bad weather and so I slept I avoid boredom when so I slept when I'm rowing I'm not bored I had music that I could listen to things you can see and that's when you think but it's when I was in my cabin that then maybe things were not and even then I'd either sleep straight away or I would go through some of the footage that I'd taken um I would imagine scenarios I'd send back footage I'd ring people so the boredom Mm -hmm. Never really was there. Maybe towards the end when I was there, like 
I'm not seeing any wildlife. I know I'm about to be there. This is like the last couple of days. Ugh. It was, it was, it, yeah, it was literally just thinking, ugh. But <laughs> you know that you're nearly there. And you've, at that point, you're thinking, I've thought of everything that possibly is to think about. And I've listened to my music, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, but I've lost my speaker. Yeah. Well, and how long did you manage to sleep for at a time in the night before you had to get up and row some more? Um, it changed every day. So sometimes I would row throughout the night because um, it would work better. Sometimes the weather was just better. Um, and then other times I would sleep for like eight hours. Sometimes it'd be six, four, twelve. Um, but it was, I always needed to get it again, depending on the weather, needed to get up and check where I was going. So waking up every two hours to see the direction my boat was um, and do and adjust my steering on deck because keeping a straight line when you don't have the auto pilot to be able to do that for you um, is quite difficult. And so to have a solid night's sleep, <laughs> unless I was on power anchor, didn't happen because I was always having to check. What effect did like interval sleeping have on your mental state, if any, do you think? I don't know. You just get used to it. And because I was also getting, yeah, you, I was, it was me and it was, my mental state was growing with me. You don't notice a change. So it's like, if you, um, like, let's say there's a baby and you see it every day, you're not going to notice any difference for a week. But if you only saw it then once and then see it the next week, you're like, it's yeah. grown so much, it's yeah. changed. But because you're there and you're always, you don't notice anything. So for me, I don't know the actual effect on my mental state or on my body even because you can't, because it's happening relatively slowly, but quickly, but you're there, you can't watch it, you know? Did it have any effect on the, your motivation to keep going like throughout time so if you became quite tired and run down would you just be like no I'm just gonna have a day off today yeah definitely I would go I'd try and tell myself you're gonna vote till this time but I would always be over ambitious and think do the impossible because you think at the moment I'm not tired so I will go for another three hours or something like that and then it's like you do another half and I go I'm <laughs> knackered now so it's always try not to say things too early and set targets too early you don't know how it's going to change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of times I just couldn't be bothered. I was like, and I don't even know why. It was just my body just went, nah. So I'd just be rowing. And then it's, he had you overthinking. It's like, what's my last oar stroke going to be? I just go, that was it. <laughs> Surprise. That was the last one. <laughs> that was so funny. And it's like, oh, okay. And so put the oars away. And then you're like, well, that's me done. Apparently didn't realize that was going to be then, but it is. <laughs> Um, and in terms of like maintaining energy and keeping your strength up, what kind of meals were you eating while on the journey? So I was meant to be eating ration packs, but I didn't really like them. They got made all too complicated. I just wanted food, really basic food. I'm not a high maintenance kind of person. Just give me some rice. I'm happy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and it was also complicated food. I was like, Ugh. No, thank you. What kind of stuff is in a ration pack? Oh, they do everything. Literally anything from beef stroganoff to carbonara, um, tikka masala, beef hot pot. Um, Quite elaborate. Literally salmon and broccoli pasta. Literally, I can't, I didn't eat enough of them to know like, every different flavour I had. Um, but yeah, there was a lot like yeah lamb beef chicken pork fish were they awful or were they okay um it depended yeah. they're all they'll be fine I can probably eat them on land just not at sea and the thing is for me I had good stuff I had biscuits and I had a lot of chocolate with me nice and so hang on you can eat the chocolate bar or you can eat some mush bit of a no-brainer I'm, I'm um, yeah, I mean, I might be a bit strange doing this rowing, but I am still human. I'm going to go for the chocolate. 100%. What kind of chocolate? Oh, everything. <laughs> um, so 
I call I had like proper chocolate and then not proper chocolate just so I'm like I've not had any proper chocolate today yes I've had a Snickers I've had a Mars and <laughs> I've had a Reese's cup when I had proper chocolate now I'm gonna have my dairy milk or now I'm gonna have my galaxy now I'm gonna have my Nestle you know, little things like that. I was like, oh, I've had some Smarties today. That's not proper chocolate. It's got shell on it. <laughs> nah, I need my proper chocolate bar. I'm going to have a lint bar now, you know. Um, so I had literally everything. Yeah, I had all sorts. I love it. When your friends and family called, how much did they kind of connect you with what was happening in the real world back at home? Um, it depended on who I called. So each sort of friend would be, without even realising, or without asking, would be like a different like portal to something. So my mum was very rowing specific. You know, it was that was only we talked about really was like rowing, was the weather, where were the boats were, what I'm doing. So she could update on Facebook. And then it's like one of my other friends, he was um we just talked about food. We literally just laid there talking about all the good food in the world and about how we're going to get really, really fat. <laughs> um, and so, and he was there like, oh, I'll tell you what, there's this new combination that I've thought, and we're, yeah, I'd be thinking, why have we never ordered this before? Why that? And so that was a bit of a strange <laughs> one. And we also talked about like, it was more what's going on in the world a little bit more. So it was there like, well, this is what's happening. At the moment, I'm British and I've got excuses. So, is everything is COVID's fault. Everything is Brexit and everything is the snow. That's it. I've got my excuses. I'm happy. So anything that goes on. <laughs> so it's just me in my like bubble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we've got, um, yeah, my other friends just each different topic. And then another one is like, right, this is what's going on in town. This is the gossip, you know. Um, All the antics. So I was not massively aware. Yeah. But um, it just depended on who I called and I needed to ask as well because they forget that I'm blind to everything I have Facebook I can't check that I don't have the news coming through I literally have nothing and so it was two weeks into a second lockdown nobody had happened to mention that to me <laughs> got out at a good time <laughs> yeah I said oh I'll ring you, I'll, I'll, I'll ring you on your, uh, your lunch break tomorrow and they're like I'm not at work I'm on furlough I'm like, why are you on furlough it's like oh lockdown I was like what yeah, <laughs> stuff like that it's like oh Cheers, guys. Thanks for letting me know. Um, see, I was aware, but very delayed, like massively delayed. Um, and even then, I say that, I feel like I've known things. I don't, I don't think I do. There's probably a lot that's gone on that I don't have a clue about. What did you miss the most about home? Like, what were you most excited to go back to upon your return? So, to me, I've still not returned yet because home is when I see my dogs. Yeah. And I've not yet seen my dogs. So that would be the biggest thing. And then it was food and just that saying, you don't know what you've got until it's gone or your grass is always greener, stuff like that. Now I'm actually like on land. I'm not even that much bothered about the food. It's <laughs> all that I could think of for 70 days. And I was thinking of all this amazing food. I was like, oh, it's going to be so good. Build it up. And now I'm here. Uh, you've got it in front of you. And I'm like, Nah. <laughs> so it, yeah it's, you say that it's like it, it was the food whilst I was out there but now I'm back here I'm like what was it what did I really want to come back to I think it's just the standing on dry land and talking I love talking to people um, and making connections and so I've I think I've managed to do quite a lot of that I've done a lot more than 70 days within the past week so <laughs> Amazing. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on sort of the scenes and nature that you saw whilst you were out in the Atlantic Ocean too. Um, can you go into more detail? Tell me about the wildlife you encountered. So I saw quite a lot. The dolphins, um, every different kind of dolphin. That was really cool. They, um, well, I say every different kind. I don't really know that many, but it's more take a picture, Google about it. So send back a picture. They Google, tell me what it was. Yeah. So that was really cool. Swam with them, big pods of them. Um, I saw some whales. Um, is then identifying different ones. They were really cool. Um, I had birds that followed me, a few different kinds of birds that were hop, like, bobbing around. Um, I just loved every moment you think you see something. And it sounds really bad, but to just see something in the water, whatever it is, 
I loved seeing. Yeah. And so I was sat at Power Anchor one day and a little boy, um, not like as in a person, like a, a, a boy, <laughs> yeah. um, came bobbing past, but it was going really slowly and I was like sat still. And honestly, I sat there for like two hours just watching it come closer. I was like, oh. Is it a boy? Is it coming closer? Oh, nearly there. <laughs> and then you're like, how long? And I'm betting myself all Playing the time of when it's going to come past me. And I'm like, is it going to be an hour? It's going to be half an hour. 10 minutes? I don't know. Hmm. Because you can't tell a scale of how far away it actually is. That's so funny. It was actually really small when it came past. But it could have been massive. You, haven't, you, you don't know. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's me counting that as well. Like, <laughs> no. Um, there's... Uh, <laughs> I saw a lot of fish. <laughs> I saw a lot of fish as well. So I got lots of Dorado. Um, I had lots of flying fish. I liked, I love it when you come on deck and there's a flying fish and it's just like, oh, hi, girl. hi mate, what are you doing? <laughs> off you go straight back into the sea. Um, so cool though. So that was quite nice. I'm jealous of swimming with the dolphins. Oh yeah, that was insane. Like really, really cool. And um, I saw... Uh, some different kinds of fish. So I had like pilot fish under my boat, which is stripy. So that was really nice to see them. Uh, but I put my hand in the water every day and they like swim over to my hand thinking I was going to feed them. And I wasn't because I'm like, if it's good food that you would yeah. eat, I'll eat it. <laughs> Get them the like um, ration pack thing. Yeah, exactly. So um, I also had something called trigger fish that were quite cool because they like swam wonky is the only way I can put it down as. Weird. Um, That's just, interesting. Yeah, they're like, like fin on top and underneath rather than the sides. Oh. Um, so, who is your favorite like sea creature companion? Oh, I don't know because I like them all. Is is sometimes it's what's a bit weirder and how often you would ever see that again. So I saw a striped marlin, which is really cool. Like, yeah, there's marlins, there's blue marlins, but the striped one as well. They're basically like a um, sailfish, like swordfishy type family. Cool, nice. Um, and they're massive and really aggressive looking. And it was, just, it was just really cool to see that. I'm like, how many times are you going to see that? It's one of the fastest fish in the sea. That's epic. Um, and so I really enjoyed that. To be fair, I can't pick out a favourite about what I enjoyed seeing because it was all, as I said, I got excited about seeing some rubbish. <laughs> and so to see any animal you can't compare yeah it's just the experience altogether yeah possibly and what are there nocturnal like sea creatures are the animals different in the evening sometimes you'd have a bird come over and it would make me like kind of jump a little bit because like, what was that you can't see anything it's pitch black um but i had my navigation lights so that would like light up quite a lot so it's actually really cool when a flying fish would go in the light of that it was like bright green you had bioluminescence as well in the water this was very random when they appeared but literally and it would make me want to do really bad rowing just so I could actually splash <laughs> the water more so then it would light up and flick like that's was, really cool was like, yeah a like bright green like goo uh. like everywhere it was like but it's water but it's water you know it's it's magical and at night you can only hear the animals. So I was in my cabin and my ears got so tuned in to like the breath that a dolphin or a whale would take. And sometimes like, because you'd be wanting to hear it so much, you'd imagine you've heard it. Wow. You know, when they take a big poof of water at the top. So I'm in my cabin, I can hear it. I was like, oh, there's dolphins outside. There's dolphins outside. Oh my gosh. So it's like jump out, stun the camera. You can't see them. Yeah. I can hear them. I can hear them all around just breathing. That's so and I'm cool. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. That's magical. But yeah, Nighttime, they're the same, but I couldn't see them anyway. Yeah. It was just the bioluminescence that were there. It must have been literally pitch black, apart from like stars and then the luminescence. Yeah, it depended on when the full moons were as well. So sometimes it, when it's full moon, it was so bright on the water that it literally, and the moon was right in front of me as well because I'm rowing backwards. It would literally, the reflection on the water going along here, honestly, it blinded me. Wow. Because the rest of it is so dark. I honestly was like, I literally will have to wear sunglasses at night time. Um, just because the moon was that insane and massive, like absolutely massive. No picture could ever get the scale of how big these moons, like bright orange, and then it turn, changes colour as it comes up. Just absolutely That's insane. Amazing, though. It's beautiful. If someone else was to set off and do exactly what you did, what would what advice would you give them? Um, my advice would be don't listen to other people. <laughs> don't even listen to me, because every single row is different. I said every day is different. I know 
everybody else in the race, we all had massive di- like different experiences. So the guy that was closest to me, only 50 miles away, was having different conditions. And you can't, you can't compare things. That ocean chooses what it does. You have no sort of ability to change that at all. It's mother nature. So when somebody gives you advice about what they found, the chances are you're going to find it different. Trust yourself a lot more. So know your own capabilities. Don't let anybody else tell you something. Um, so for me, it's like people saying, you need to take ration packs. These are the best options of the lightest. That's it. Everybody does it. Take your ration packs. If I was to go again, I would not take ration packs. I would take canned food because yes, it's heavier, but I don't care about the weight. I, I like canned food. It was edible and I'd have actually got some decent calories on me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's little things like that. People say in all sorts, this is my advice. That's my advice. And I'm like, really be careful about what they say for anything. Trust your instincts and ask questions, take it on board, but don't, yeah, they might be telling the truth for their thing, but don't always believe it. So I have so much advice that I would say or that I would give myself back. But I'm also really wary that if I did it again, I might hate myself for giving me that advice. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a vicious circle with it. More than happy to tell people things and my experiences, but I wouldn't tell them things as in apply this to you. I, 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 could, I wouldn't do that because that's what ruined my trip a little bit being told you have to take the seasickness I would recommend oh, yeah. you put the patches on you know and that just ruined it for the first few days and I'm like I did that because of multiple people told me that I would probably get seasick and to definitely put the patches on there's no harm in doing it anyway and there you go ruined it probably the most dangerous part of the trip yeah exactly and people were just trying to be nice trying to be helpful um but then again I didn't know that was going to happen so I'm not blaming anybody. It's just, yeah. Cool. And what's... Just um, be careful. Just be really careful. (laughs) What's next on the horizon for you? Not sure. There's quite a lot of stuff going on at the moment and I need to finish this. I'm still living it. I've not had that time. I've only been finished a week and I've not had that reflection time really yet. It's just been more talking about this. I need to actually... I mean, I'll have like a day. I'll sit there on the beach and I'll start thinking. I'll go... I was wrong. I've said the same thing over and over again to every different <laughs> news story. And I was wrong. Or I, I remember something different, so I'm expecting that to happen. But um, I don't know. I want to do something. I don't know what yet. It's then just logistically. And also me, this took me, it was a three-year process from finding out about the race. And so to rush anything, I can't. And I don't want to devalue what I've just done either. Yeah, There'll be stuff. 100%. I really want to. I want to go traveling. Um, and I'm expecting something to sort of come to me a little bit. Or not expecting, but I feel like it might because that's what happened here. I just came across the end of this race. I feel like I'm going to come across something and it will fit. And how can people find you on social media or online? What are your handles? What's your website? Um, everything is under Ruddily Mad. So that was my team name in this race. Um, literally everything website go from the pages socials ruddily mad cool and is there anything or anyone you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap up um it would just be to all my sponsors actually they know who they are we've got Ben Kamatic Group we've got Bet UK Lang for Engineering there's, there's loads of people and then there's my best mates there's Mark T um yeah my dogs as well of course, they, they, they need a better mention. Forget about the friends and family, my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine, it's been great to chat with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Same for you. Thanks for inviting me. If you want to support the charities mentioned in this podcast and donate to their cause, you can follow the links in the episode summary to find out more. Thinking of Peace is brought to you by Maybe Ski, a Whistler-based adventure ski company creating bucketless ski trips across the globe. If you're looking to get off the beaten track and away from the crowds, head over to maybeski.com to discover what lies beyond your lift pass.